today on the Debunking Economics podcast with Professor Steve Keen, a topic that keeps talkback radio phone lines running hot. When they're not talking about too many foreigners coming into the country, it's foreigners buying too much of our land or too many of our companies. So today we ask, foreign ownership, is it a good thing or a bad thing? That's today on the Debunking Economics podcast. Yes, hello, I'm Phil Dobby. Now, foreign ownership is a contentious issue. We blame foreign-owned companies when they downgrade or pull out of a country. Uh, And we don't like foreigners owning land because we fear food security uh, is going to be compromised, whatever that means. I mean, if World War III strikes, I would have thought we'd still be able to access the food in our fields, even if it's owned by foreign companies, wouldn't you? I don't think we'll really care too much about who owns the field. So are we right to be worried about foreign ownership, foreign companies or individuals own land, farms in other words, or mining land, and they own houses and businesses. Is any of that a problem? Uh, I wonder how much of this is overblown. Well, Steve, I mean, in Australia, is it overgrown, uh, overblown? Because 14% of agricultural land is in foreign ownership. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot to me. 14% is pretty substantial, actually. And if you think about uh, how does it relate to the productivity of the other sections that are under under ownership, it depends upon – and a lot of that ownership is, is the enormous uh, – maybe people's uh, vision and ideas, it's truly enormous uh, – land devoted to um, cattle farming in the north of the country. So there are some farms in the north of the country that are bigger than Belgium, mm. so uh, which are foreign-owned. And uh, you, you, you would expect those to be um, – the higher productivity levels and some of the some of the more you know small scale dairy farming and things of that nature that uh, tend to remain in local ownership, but I um, I the, the, I've got an ambivalent feeling towards it because it depends on um, you know to what extent is this a case of um, um, vive la difference and you have a, a, a different approach to capitalism having an impact on your um, on your local society in ways which may both can both be, be, be beneficial because new ways of doing things are brought in mm. uh, because you can always see in, in that sense the movement of Amazon into a different country as is also happening in Australia right now as a sign of that and that's a technology which no local uh, the, the Amazon uh, marketplace is a technology that no Australian company has developed any particular Right. Um, variant of, therefore, you've got a, a new form of commerce for the society. Right. So, so you're saying, that, so you're saying that's a good thing. I mean, to use the Australian vernacular, it's like a kick up the arse for the retail industry, isn't it? Which it needs, yeah. yeah. So in that case, you can say, all right, it's it's good to have these you know, these foreign uh, foreign ideas coming in because they are ideas that were not developed domestically and they are worth uh, experiencing. Equally, of course. Uh, there'll be, you know, Tesla vehicles turning up in the country. Yeah, um, but that's uh, a, that's a different proposition to owning land, isn't it? So you have this you have this argument that uh, you know we are literally in Australia selling the farm. In other words, you know, here's here's land that we're using to produce goods which we're selling to ourselves or selling overseas. Yeah. Why would we sell that land? to foreign owners who reap the benefits of it and uh, and also repatriate the profits back overseas. Well, this, this, this comes back to the question of whether it's a, a positive development because you're getting some new ideas coming in or it's a negative one because your own economy is unsustainable in various ways and you end up having to sell off the the, the, you know, the crown jewels to, to finance your activities. And that's the area where I think uh, I've, I've got my uh, cr- critical attitude towards things like land being sold because... Uh, the, the, the classic um, balance situation for the globe is the sum of all trade surpluses is zero until such time as you start trading, trading with, uh, you know, any Elon Musk outputs on Mars, uh, the balance of trade for the entire planet is zero. If you're running a trade deficit and persistently doing it, uh, then there is a need, you have to balance that loss in the current account uh, by generating money to buy uh, the goods you're buying from overseas on the capital account. Right. And that, in, in you know that, that's putting it in a rather jargonistic way but if you if you run a you know if you run a say a, a billion dollar deficit in one year what that means is that the if you had stocks of foreign money for stocks of, of australian dollars at the at the uh, sorry american dollars uh let's just take a british example now um stocks of uh, american dollars at the um, bank of england and your local consumers were persistently buying more american goods than they were buying British goods, then to actually pay for those uh, American goods, you've got to um, either use what you've got in reserve. If you don't have enough in reserve, then you have to sell 
uh, various assets domestically mm. uh, to, to raise American dollars. But these so are private. These are private companies, obviously with farms. These are private individuals who are selling the farms, and you know, I, I guess they they probably got mixed feelings as well because they're getting a better price. If you open the universe uh, from domestic buyers to to global buyers, obviously you're going to push the price up. You're going to get more for your land. Not, oh, yeah, well, yeah, again, again, that's a quote taking it out of context in some ways because has the economy been growing so slowly uh, that you've been uh, running yourself slowly into the ground and therefore the capacity for local buyers to pay a decent price uh, is not because they're being stingy compared to the foreigners, it's because they simply aren't generating enough uh, income flow themselves to be able to purchase those domestically generated assets. And it's more that case that applies in countries like the UK where it's losing land overseas and certainly Australia, which has been running trade deficits of the order of 5% of GDP for virtually 40 or 50 years. But it's, interesting, because, it's interesting you mentioned the UK because you know who the biggest landholder in, in Australia is? It's not China. It is the it's UK. the UK, is it? Mm, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty close. I mean, China's about to take over. Um, mm. But, yeah, certainly the biggest landholder at the moment. Hmm. Mm. So there we are. Um, but, I mean, on the balance of trade question, I mean, it's, you're on a hiding to nothing, aren't you? Because, I mean, you, you ultimately you make the balance of trade worse. So, I mean, because you're producing goods and, 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 okay, a foreign owner might get more out of that land or more out of that factory and might be more productive. Uh, but also because they're taking a, a slug of that money back overseas, that's not helping your balance of trade situation. Well, fundamentally, what you've handed over is the, the, the your capitalists are now foreign. Your work is a domestic. Yeah. And uh, it's the extent to which uh, your local market encourages those capitalists to invest domestically as to how much of those profits are retained inside the country and used to develop uh, your industrial base or your, your, your corporate base in, in, the, in, the, in the host country. But this is the classic story of multinational corporations. And um, when, when it's amplified by countries running persistent trade deficits, and of course, these things are all supposed to be eliminated by floating exchange rates something like 30 or 40 years ago. Well, so much for that story. Uh, we've still got persistent trade balances around the world. And what happens in that case, the countries running the deficits ultimately are ceding their capitalist class to a foreign, to foreign, a foreign capitalist class because, uh, as you say, over time, the ownership of resources uh, falls into foreign hands. And you don't really have any domestic capitalists anymore. Not you don't have none, obviously, but you have a, a decline in the extent to which there are local capitalists who are potentially locally likely to invest locally. So it's the slow growth of the economy because it's been you know, less successful industrial policies, less successful exchange rate policies, as John Mills emphasises, uh, means that over time you actually end up having um, to sell your assets. Your assets are owned by the capitalists rather than the workers. So you end up having you know, domestic wage and income and foreign foreign profit. Okay, and we leave that conversation there with 20 or 25 minutes or more still to go. If you're a subscriber to this podcast series, then you can hear it in full. To subscribe, go to debunkingeconomics.com and pick one of the subscription plans in the right-hand side of the website or support Steve Keen on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash prof Steve Keen. If you provide $10 or more support per month, then you get access to all the podcasts in this series. And uh, in the remainder of this discussion, we look at more of the pros and cons of foreign ownership, including including the reasons given by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade on their website. They list the benefits of foreign investment. So how many of them have they got right? Well, you'll find out if you listen to this full version of this podcast and, uh, of course, many more in this series as well with Professor Steve Keen. I'm Phil Dobby. Thanks for listening. 